Hello and welcome back. And this presentation is called Reciprocity and its Size Limits. I hope you enjoy it. So we're going to try to answer four questions in this short presentation. First, what is reciprocal altruism? We're going to review that. Second, what lessons can we draw from Robert Axelrod's Tournament of Cooperation? Third, what is Martin Nowak's rule on the limits of direct reciprocity? And fourth, how does indirect reciprocity differ from direct reciprocity? So let's begin with the problem of altruism. And the problem is that if you are an altruist, you harm your own reproductive success in order to benefit the reproductive success of other individuals. And how could such behaviors ever be selected for? How would that ever evolve? How can we win by losing? This is the problem of altruism that we've been wrestling with all semester. So one solution to this is Robert Triver's model of reciprocal altruism. And in our account of this, we have two agents, blue and orange. And in the first interaction, blue benefits orange. And as a result, the reproductive success of blue is harmed. So blue benefits orange, blue is harmed. A key observation here is that the harm is assumed to be much less than the benefit. Now when altruism is then reciprocated, orange benefits blue, and as a result, orange is harmed. So now things flow back reciprocally the other direction, and again the harm is much less than the benefit. So that's terribly important for Triver's idea to work. And when we add those up, it works out that A and B, blue and orange, both benefit uh, more than they're harmed. Now there's two critical points again to stress about this. First, the benefit to the recipient must outweigh the harm to the altruistic donor. If this isn't the case, reciprocal altruism, the model doesn't work. Second, the donor's altruism must be reciprocated. If that doesn't happen, the model doesn't work. And then there's one key observation to make here, which explains the excitement over this. And this is that organisms who engage in reciprocal altruism need not be close genetic relatives. So this seems to free the evolution of cooperation and altruism from Hamilton's rule. Now the puzzle is how can such reciprocity get started and how can it manage to persist? And several solutions again have been offered, but what they all share is an emphasis on repetition. Repetition, another term for that is iterated. So a key part of the solution or later models of reciprocity is iteration. An example of this is Robert Axelrod's Prisoner's Dilemma Tournament. So Robert Axelrod is a political scientist and in the late 1970s he invited different uh, scholars who were working on the Prisoner's Dilemma to submit computer models and then he loaded those models all up into a program and they played against one another in a tournament. And this tournament was iterated. It was repeated interactions. So in Robert Axelrod's tournament, each player was a program strategy that had been written uh, by a sociologist or political scientist or evolutionary biologist. Uh, one of them was written by Anatole Rappaport, who had been working on game theory probably longer than anybody outside of economics. And he submitted the simplest model called tit for tat. And what happens there is the first interaction, this model always cooperates, and then it responds in kind. 
Another strategy that was submitted was called Always Cooperate, All C, and this means whatever the other player does, continue to cooperate. Another was called All D, Always Defect, and this means never cooperate, no matter what the other player does. And there were many other strategies. We're just going to focus on these three. They're fairly easy to understand. So these strategies are all put into this tournament, and then the players, uh, the strategies, interact randomly, and after a certain amount of time, it stopped, and the scores are all added up. So what was the winning strategy? Well, it turned out, as is often noted, that it was Anatole Rappaport's tit-for-tat, but we can see why tit-for-tat might do good, just thinking in terms of the three strategies that we've discussed. So when tit-for-tat meets itself, cooperation will follow, and the same thing obviously will happen when tit-for-tat meets always cooperate. Cooperation will ensue and it will just continue. No one will ever defect. However, it's often overlooked that always defect was very close as a runner-up to tit-for-tat. In fact, there were six strategies that were almost uh, neck-and-neck finishers. And of course, always defect plays never cooperate. Now, when always defect encounters tit for tat, it always wins the first round, and then they both continue to defect on one another for the rest of their encounters. But when always defect meets always cooperate, it's going to win in every round. So always uh, defect was actually much more effective than it's often given credit for. And it actually is what's called an ESS. That's an evolutionarily stable strategy. And this means if you have a whole population uh, that always plays, always defect, you can't get a cooperative strategy started in that population because it's going to shut them down. So if there's just a lone mutant, uh, a one uh, individual out there who plays always cooperate or tit for tat, they're never going to get started in an always defect population. And this is really an interesting uh, observation. So what then has to happen for cooperation to get started and then to persist? Right. So you need more than one cooperator and they have to be able to find one another over and over again. And secondly, their, action, their own interactions have to be repeated or iterated because other than always cooperate, which appears to be a fairly vulnerable strategy uh, to invasion and defeat by other strategies, um, the, in all of the others, uh, your other player is likely to defect on you if they know that the interaction won't be repeated again. So we can draw these two lessons. It, interactions have to continue to be repeated and cooperators have to be able to find one another to reciprocate. So let's go back to our model here. And in trying to explain this, Martin Nowak, a mathematician, came up with a rule, and it's similar to Hamilton's rule. But it's P is greater than C divided by B. And P stands for the probability of two agents interacting again and the rule is that that probability has to exceed the cost-benefit ratio of their interaction. So here's an example of this. If our probability of meeting again is only 10%, then the reproductive benefit of our reciprocity has to be 10 times greater than the reproductive cost. So this fits very well with Triver's original model, but in this case it's discounted by the probability of meeting again. Right? If it were only 1%, then the benefit would have to be 100 times greater than the cost. Let's look at another. If our probability of meeting again is 20%, the reproductive benefit must then be 5 times greater than the reproductive cost. But if we have a high probability of meeting again, say 50%, then the reproductive benefit needs only be 2 times greater than the reproductive cost. So are there limits to direct reciprocity? Well, yes, 
And by direct reciprocity, we mean these interactions between two agents, so what are called pairwise interactions. And one argument uh, in this direction is by Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis on page 63 of their book, A Cooperative Species, where they argue that the plausibility of the model of direct recipro reciprocity does not extend to large groups. So there's a size limit to this. It's a small scale type of institution. So if we consider a hunter-gatherer band like the Zutwazi of southwestern Africa, well here people are living in groups of 10 to 25 and although the membership is fluctuating, uh, the whole population of the area is several hundred people. So it's very likely that any two individuals will see each other again and they'll interact repeatedly. This means that cooperators will easily find one another in a Zutwazi band. But now let's consider a metropolis. So this is a shot of New York City. How likely is it that you will interact repeatedly with a stranger in a large city? So I didn't say with your best friend or your mother, right? But with a stranger. In fact, we consider altruistic acts between strangers in large cities to be newsworthy. And back in the fall of 2012, uh, there was this news story, which some of you might remember, where a New York City police officer bought a homeless man a nice pair of boots. It was in the winter and it was cold. And he immediately uh, became a celebrity and uh, obtained his 15 minutes of fame. And it lasted literally 15 minutes. But for a while, he was all the talk of the morning news shows. Now, it wouldn't have been as surprising, this story, if we had learned later that the man he'd helped was his nephew. Right? That wouldn't be so newsworthy. We'd say, well, that just is inclusive fitness. Of course you'd help your nephew. And it wouldn't be as surprising if we'd learned later that they were old friends and that the man he helped at, at one point helped him out at a tough point in his life. Then we'd say, well, that's reciprocal altruism. But what was puzzling about this is that they'd never met before and likely would never meet again. So why would he do this? And one argument is, well, it has to do with indirect reciprocity. So he gained his 15 minutes of fame from being observed acting in an altruistic manner and the New York City Police Department gained a lot of good press. So indirect reciprocity refers to benefits that we derive from others who observe our generous act. So we're going to finish here by distinguishing two kinds of reciprocity. First direct reciprocity, this is where the benefits flow directly between two partners. So we can model that as blue and orange, exchanging benefits. And secondly, indirect reciprocity, where the reward to the altruist comes from the reputation, and it comes from others than those who they are altruistic towards. So here we have orange benefiting blue, and in indirect reciprocity, what follows from that is that pink, who sees this, uh, then behaves in an altruistic manner towards orange. Now there's also what seem to be a size limit to this, and this is how many people can possibly know your reputation. And think about this again in terms of a Zutwazi band uh, versus New York City. Uh, chances are, in a small group, everyone's going to know your reputation. But in a large city, only the people who you interact with regularly will know your reputation. Thank you for listening.